Hey everybody, welcome to episode 8 of Game Retail Ramblings. I'm your host, Travis Severance, coming from the largest game store in North America, Millennium Games, in a galaxy far, far away, Rochester, New York, today. Thanks to everybody that's taken the time to like and subscribe. It's really helped us grow the channel. The feedback has been fantastic. I appreciate everybody that watched the Free RPG Day. Really good comments on that as well. We've still got a few kits left, so feel free to stop by freerpgday.com if you're a retailer that's still looking to get involved. Social media previews have started too, so you'll see some of the stuff in kind of a, a nicer package uh, going up on all of our different socials there so you can get an idea what the contents of the kit look like if you're a fan or if you're a retailer that wants to know a little bit more about it. Feedback on the previous video was great. New producer, new video editor, a leveled up presentation. That's thanks to Brian and Logan from Crush Cards who are just absolutely amazing at the work that they do. They make me look a lot better than I actually do. So thank you to them. Uh, the topic for today is going to be Star Wars Unlimited. This weekend there was a 222 person event in the UK, which to my knowledge is the largest event thus far for this game. It's super, super promising when it comes to that kind of thing. We host events here on Wednesdays and we're actually starting Sundays as well. Not this Sunday because everybody's out doing Easter egg hunts, but all Sundays going forward, we're going to have events as well. And our attendance so far has been 30 plus. When we ran our pre-release over the course of a couple of different events, and then we ran another one on Wednesday, we were over 120 people all together. Really nice mix of product as far as like what they had available for us to sell. We were allowed to sell the accessories on the pre-release and stuff. Starters were available, that sort of thing. It was a really, really nice way that they presented that. And I wanted to talk a little bit today sort of about my experience as a retailer with Star Wars Unlimited in general and, and how I sort of got to the point where I decided to take my largest buying position for any game that I've ever done on set one. The first time I heard anything about the game was on March 16th. One minute trailer went live. It showed Star Wars Unlimited. It showed some cards. The artwork was... Um, I would say the artwork was controversial is probably not the correct word, but it was certainly elicited strong feelings from people. Some people loved it. I thought it was neat and different. Some people hated it. A lot of the preview stuff that they showed in that first trailer was all based on older Star Wars stuff too. So we're talking about episodes, you know, four, five, and six. Uh, none of the newer stuff was in there. It, it was, you know, all the fan favorites between, you know, Luke and, and Vader and, and Leia was there and so on and so forth. So from that little video, you could sort of extrapolate what kind of game they were going to have. And then after that, they went live for about 40 minutes through the FFG channel. FFG has gone through a ton of changes over the last couple of years. Uh, a lot of management has changed. A lot of the people that are there that sort of built the brand are not the same folks that are there in those leadership roles now. They've either gone on to other things, they've started their own companies, they've, they're have they working for another company. But I used to know the people at FFG really, really well and had a really tight relationship with them. And I still continue to have a good relationship with those people as well. They've just moved on to other opportunities. So I don't know a lot of the people inside of that place anymore. So the first stream went up, it, it still only has about 30,000 views, which is interesting considering how much the game has grown and how big the game is right now. And, and we're introduced to three different people. Uh, there's Josh Massey, who was the person that was in charge of their OP. He came from Pokemon. There was Danny Schaefer, who was the senior designer. And then there was Jim Cartwright, who was listed as the product strategy director. You've got OP, you've got design, and you've got product strategy director. So like that's all the cooks you need to make a meal, really. If they had their salesperson that was there as well, uh, that's everything that you need to make a game work. It's just that easy. Grab those three people, put them in those positions, and you're basically done. They did a really nice job laying out uh, what to expect with the game, what they were looking to do with the license, and how they were going to move forward. And... I'll be honest, I didn't watch the video. I did not watch the video at that at that time. It wasn't my focus. The trailer came out and I looked at that and I, I thought, okay, this is another Star Wars card game. This will be, I don't know. I don't know if we count Young Jedi, but if I do count Young Jedi and I look at the number of different Star Wars card games that I've sold, it's pretty significant at this point. I think the only licensed property I've probably sold more card game versions of might be Warhammer. So it's another run at this. Uh, if I count Star Wars Destiny as well, we've gone down this path a bunch of times. Why is it new? What's what's going to be compelling about it? Why do I even care? What was sort of the approach that I took on it. If I look at what they did after that, they had some new faces that came on. They did the quick start rules on June 27th. They talked about organized play on July 12th. Uh, July 16th, they talked about the demo decks and what they were going to do at Gen Con. And during that conversation, we were introduced to Jeremy Zwerm. Now, Jeremy Zwerm is somebody that I'm familiar with. Jeremy Zwerm was very involved with Star Wars Destiny. The first couple of sets of Star Wars Destiny did really, really well for us. 
uh, that was a game that was compelling and different and interesting with big chonky dice and something that had a an immediate success right out of the gates. It was something that a lot of retail looked at and they sort of tire kicked it for the same reasons. Another Star Wars game, the dice look juvenile, we don't like the artwork, it's not a game that I don't know who I'm going to sell this to, so on and so forth. When it comes to Star Wars, anything, I try to take a really good, deep look at whatever it is, just based on the point that the license itself and the fandom is now multiple generations. So it's not just a young kid or a dad, it's it's grandfathers, it's grandmothers, it's wives, it's children, it's it's a, it's a, I mean, we're talking 77 at this point was the first movie, I believe. I wasn't old enough to watch that one, but I certainly caught Jedi in the theater with my dad. I was young then, really young, uh, like three. But I like the Ewoks. So we start getting introduced to this this cast of characters and stuff, and they're they're doing more and more and more shows. So they do Gen Con, they come back from Gen Con, there was a huge amount of demos that was going on at Gen Con. The reality of it is at the time, Lorcana had kind of sucked the wind out of everything in the TCG world at that point. A D&D was sort of trying to rebound from this OGL nightmare that they were going through. Uh, Magic wasn't in a great place, even though the last couple of sets had done okay, it was still sort of trying to figure out what it's doing in the market. It started to rebound at that point, but it really wasn't a big focus of that show. It was Lorcana, Lorcana, Lorcana. I was getting clubbed over the head with Mickey Mouse every time I turned around, and people were just going nuts. They were literally trampling people to get in the door for that game. So there wasn't a lot of room and there wasn't a lot of space to sort of germinate another game. So they did a bunch of demos there. Then when I started to pay attention, and it's so weird the things that come along or that get put in front of me that is the thing that I'm like, huh, that's odd or that's different. I wasn't paying attention to any of these videos. They went up, it wasn't put in a space that I was that I was looking at. It wasn't, uh, I don't believe that the videos were hosted themselves on the FFG website. Initially, I think there ended up being a SWOO website that happened and they were sort of there. And there was articles posted and it was, it was really brilliantly done now that I look back at it. But the thing that brought me into taking a look at it was they were gonna be at TwitchCon. Of all the places, that somebody would decide to plop down a game and to show and to have some exposure and stuff. TwitchCon was a really weird space for me to have them decide they were going to present the game to their fans and, and they were going to open it up to sort of this, you know, digital movie market thing. And like, what are we doing here? And there was some really good feedback on that. I was surprised that they did that because it's certainly outside of the norm. I'm not sure how many other card games were actually at TwitchCon other than them. So. You know, when it comes to opportunities like that, they probably own the show when it came to our space as far as like getting in touch with influencers and having other people play the game. So really progressive, sort of a smart decision to make. I'm not sure how their team overall would look at it, but it was certainly the thing that made me uh, sort of step back and take notice because it's not a place that normally we see our stuff. Fast forward a little bit. They continue to release information on the sets. Uh, they talk about the booster packs and they start talking about uh, frame treatment and foils and different things like that. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is a kind of a different FFG. Foils and frame treatment and collectability and hyperspace and showcase and all this other stuff isn't really the way that they did collectibles before. It's not really how they did Destiny as well. They, sure, they had some legendaries and they had different things like that as far as rarity goes, but in general, it wasn't something that they've ever leaned into in the TCG space. And then it, that even went further. When their organized play was announced, it was really clear they had a very clear roadmap. They're going to start using event packs as part of their offers for for players that play in their organized play. That is not an FFG thing. Like, you know, the, the, the laugh used to be that you know, your FFG prize kit was coming out and it was some tokens and it was some alternate art cards and there was a play mat in there. And I don't know how many play mats I have for Game of Thrones, but it's it won a quarter or whatever they were doing them for. So it was like literally the most boring thing. And the, the artwork is beautiful. I don't want to take away from anything, but it was so repetitive and so anti-modern, I guess. I don't even know if that's a word, but I'm going to try it. Um, it was not anything that was progressive. It wasn't fun. It wasn't interesting. It wasn't new. So this new take was pretty amazing. I started watching some content creators. My current content creators that I pay attention to in the background are the guys at Unplayable, Ice Cave Radio, Golden Dice, KTOD, uh, Dan from Main Deck, Garbage Rollers. All those guys do really, really compelling, interesting things. I feel for them right now because it's sort of at a point where we've played and played and played and played and we've got all these decks and yeah, the main set was a big set. 
but spoiler season hasn't started for season two yet, so they can't do speculation. And for a game that was first featured on May 16th, where the release date wasn't until pre-release was March 1st, it's really, really difficult to hold attention for that period of time. You know, Stranger Things is going to come out with a new season here in a little bit, and we're going to all be excited about Stranger Things for about four hours, and then Stranger Things won't be talked about again unless they do a movie or another show. So trying to keep the attention of hobbyists, gamers, Star Wars fans, people, it, for that period of time, is a really, really heavy lift. And looking back at the way that their plan was, they did a good job of spacing everything out about 30 days, where they were sort of bringing more to you, bringing more to you, bringing more to you. It would have been a hell of a lot easier for me if I just watched it as I went along, but like I said, I ignored it. And I saw the Twitch thing, I started paying attention a little bit, and I got a phone call from somebody who's pretty important to me in the industry. And, I, and she was talking to me on the phone and she said, hey, are you gonna go to PAX Unplugged? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I go to PAX Unplugged every single year. It's a fantastic show. It's positioned so that it sort of recharges my batteries for the holiday push. It's the beginning of, of December and it's in Philly and I love Philly, great food, good shows, good people, lots of friends that live there. It's a show that's filled with people that are fans and they're happy to be there and there's not a lot of misery there. They're just really good people in the community that, that are excited about playing games. I said, why, what's up? And she said, I'd, I'd like you to meet up with somebody to talk about Star Wars Unlimited. And I kind of groaned. And I'm just, <laughs> I was like, eh, okay, well, what do you want? You know, there's nobody in this industry that calls me in and asks me to go and talk to somebody else in this industry because they're looking for a cheerleader or somebody to have fireworks or to, to clap and tap you on the ass and say, great job. If they're bringing me in, they want to hammer and they want to hammer alone. They just want the nuts and bolts of it. They want the directness of it. It's a blessing and a curse to be as direct as I am. So I said, yeah, absolutely. I will, I will meet with this person and have a conversation about Star Wars Unlimited. So sure enough, the time comes, I meet with the person. It's a, a gentleman by the name of Zach Sousa, who is the head of sales, a vice president for um, Asmodee NA. We're talking about Star Wars Unlimited. And we're talking about Star Wars Unlimited and they have another table of a bunch of people that are there. They're demoing the game. And I got to have a really frank conversation with him about some of his background, where he was coming from, what their expectations was for the game and how I felt about the game. And at the time, outside of a very small amount of time that I invested in looking at the game, my feeling wasn't different from very many other people, I don't think. Star Wars is a little bit tired. What have they done lately? The most compelling thing I saw was Andor. I don't care for this Mandalorian episode. Uh, Ahsoka was fine. Uh, the, none of the books have been great. You know, they're, they've been kind of lambasting us in that world with Shatterpoint. There's been so many releases for Shatterpoint that it's been hard to, hard to sort of keep up. I said, the game looks fine, but there isn't anything in the game that is new or different to me. There wasn't anything that was overly compelling or hard to understand. And at the time, what I had was basically just the spoilers and a sample of what the decks looked like and just a general idea of what the gameplay was like with limited amount of cards. And so we asked questions about how, what I would look at as far as like, how do we get this in front of more people? What do we, what do, we do to sort of look at stimulating interest, stimulating sales? And at the time, I had sat down with the folks from Altered at Gen Con and had gotten to see that game and had flown to Baltimore to go be part of the road show down there that my buddy Paul was hosting at games and stuff. And I started having really good conversations with that team about what their next steps were and got really excited about altered. So my suggestion to him was you got to You got to get the game out to more stores. You got to put it in front of more stores and you got to have people pay attention to it. I said, I'm going to go back home and I'll do a deep dive on this thing. I'll take a look at what I think could be some opportunities. I know that a lot of times the stuff has already moved forward to the point of no return, so there's not a lot of opportunity to be able to move around. And dealing with LucasArts, a lot of times you can't necessarily send out promo stuff because promo stuff is part of their license agreement and it costs you money and, and it gets difficult and it gets challenging and there's all kinds of different agreements that they have with, with licensors where things get a little fiddly when you're trying to go ahead of the release date and do things. All of that said, uh, I was impressed at how much he listened, uh, what he went into action for. The next thing I knew, there was a sort of road show that was happening at different stores. There were a bunch of people that were reached out to to host different events and things like that. There's a couple of digital apps that allow you to try the game before you buy it. I got on those and I played those. And then I started going through these videos. I just went series by series, video by video, looking at everything that they were doing for the game. And it was the most impressive rollout that I've ever seen for a card game 
being in the industry. So this will be my 23rd or 24th year. I've never seen a team put together such a comprehensive approach to bringing the game to the market, bringing the game to the fans, bringing the game to the people, really going behind the curtain, very strategically deploying uh, messaging when it came to gameplay, it came to organized play, it came to uh, different events and how they were going to host those and why they were going to be different and why the game mechanics were relevant and going from aspect to aspect to explain design flaw, design philosophies and things like that. And, and then playing and interacting with the community. I mean, hats off to that team. It, just the timing at the time when they were starting to do that stuff, the industry was sort of in this weird place. A lot of people were sort of in a down year. The COVID money was gone at that point. Lorcana was, was sort of the straw that stirred the drink. Everybody was terrified about what was happening because Pokemon wasn't selling just because it had Pokemon on it. So if you go back as a publisher and you were to take a look at how they rolled this thing out, it's, it's, the, it's one of the most impressive rollouts that I've ever seen from a team that was dedicated to a licensor, dedicated to um, understanding what they needed to do with the brand, how to move a game forward, really nice design ticks. To the point of, I, I know when I had that conversation with them in December, just based on them having the conversations that they had with me, that sales numbers probably weren't where they wanted it to be. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in this kind of, where are we at? Where are we failing? So fast forward now, conversations have been had. They're, they're developing, you know, they're working on set six or set seven. So they, they've got a nice two-year lead ahead of them so they can make some adjustments based on what the meta ends up being. They were smart enough that despite the sales not being there, uh, maybe early on, they realized that they had a really good game. So they brought in some junior designers behind the senior team to be able to support them a little bit, which is super interesting because a lot of times when it comes to games and game design, you see the opposite happen. You will see people that will, they, they put all their assets into set one, set one comes out and it's fantastic. And then the rest of the game goes to shit because they start removing people or they, they shift people around or they put you know, some of these designers and some of the people that were part of the development team go into other projects because now they've got the hook into the customer and so on and so forth. These guys did the opposite. They said, we've got a really impressive game. We want to make sure that we really handle this well. Let's hire some other designers. And then we were introduced to those if you were following along in the videos like I wasn't until the very end. Overall, I, I, I couldn't pl complain about anything. A couple of things that I just wanted to speculate on, which isn't something that I normally do. A lot of, a lot of conversation about art and budget and that sort of thing that I think a lot of the reason why the cards look sort of the way that they do, aside from the specific aesthetic that they decided to take on, has to do with some budget. I don't think initially they had a massive budget for this game to say, okay, we're going to put all these resources and assets into this thing until we know we've got something that's a hit. So when you look at some of the artwork and that kind of stuff, I like the majority of the artwork. There's some, there's some art in there that is... I'll just call it nondescript, or it doesn't feel doesn't feel overly compelling, but not for nothing, any card game on the planet, I can look at that. I would assume that the art is probably gonna be, gonna look a little bit different, or there's gonna be a little more to it in the following sets, given the success that it's had. The other thing that I'll speculate is, I think part of the reason why, aside from what they said with regard to OP, OP sort of taking its time and allowing the meta to solve, I think the same thing. I don't think they wanted to commit to a giant Star Wars Unlimited Worlds event unless they knew they sold some packs ahead of time because you have to book those venues way out. You have to make sure that you've got the staff to do that. You've got to invest in that. And without knowing if the thing's going to sell, you, you need to wait before you put the cart before the horse. All of that to say, you know, the pre-launch roadshow helped us out a ton and we get to pre-release in day one and the launch is absolutely absurd. We've... <laughs> We've sold a, a ton of product and we had the opportunity the first week to order more like everybody else did and we did that and we placed some back orders. Overall, I, I can't be happier with the way that the game has hit with the customers, the, the, the amount of people that I have playing, the people that have, have come back to the store that I haven't seen in a little while because they are Star Wars fans and they like card games. They're not necessarily miniatures players so they can play with cards again. In new players, I mean, I've got, I've got somebody who's been a friend of mine for a really long time who has a son that's now old enough where he's actually playing across the table from me which is just super super weird to me but awesome at the same time he's a giant star wars fan and a good card gamer too probably gonna end up being better than his dad sorry about that pat so i'm just gonna go through really briefly because i'm i'm getting short on time i'm gonna go through uh seven keys for success if they're gonna keep this train on the tracks and they're gonna keep it going forward these are the things that i that i think are gonna either help or they could hinder depending on the direction that they decide to go 
Uh, number seven, obviously, this is huge. Uh, the license width on Star Wars is amazing. It's really nice to see them on set one leaning into as many different places and as many different characters as they possibly can, right? So we're seeing things from Battlefront. We're seeing things from books. We're seeing book things from the show. We're seeing things from the cartoon, from the anime. There's characters from all over the place, and it's really nice to see them leaning into as many of those different areas where you can actually consume Star Wars in one place. It's cool for me when I look at a card and I don't understand who Del Mico is because I've never seen that person before and I have to look them up and find out how cool they are. So there's some reverse effect too. So they're getting me back involved with the other part of the license as well to look at other stuff that I haven't seen before that might have been cool that I didn't check out. Number six, and this is pretty simple, uh, the, the game is remarkably easy to learn. It's not a heavy lift by anybody that's familiar with any card games at all. And even if you're not familiar with card games, it's not overly complex. There's not a ton of keywords. Most of the keywords have parentheses text. It's written out. So learning to play the game is pretty good. And at the same time, it's, it's a pretty compelling experience. Number five is set design depth. If they continue on the same pace and they keep themselves two or two and a half years in the future, they can make adjustments that they need to on the way back as opposed to feeling like they have to play catch up all the time. I'm really encouraged by that. I mean, and they feel strongly enough where on that opening, that opening video, they actually released the names of all three of the sets, which is, you know, really putting your flag in the sand to say that they're working on something and it's gonna be around forever. Uh, number four, and I touched on this as well, adding members to the team, seeing different people come in, bringing in new junior designers. The one concern that I have for there is I know, and he posted it, uh, Josh Massey, who was sort of the, uh, the mad scientist that came with the organized play that put a lot of that stuff together, that came from Pokemon and worked there and did this really nice roadmap, has since moved on to UVS Games. So uh, great job for UVS Games. I'm interested to see who fills Josh's shoes while Josh is out the door because that plan uh, was just as critical to me as a retailer and as somebody that wants to play the game as anything else that they showed. So hopefully they get somebody in with the same sort of mentality and the same kind of understanding of what an LGS needs to be successful with the game and also what communities want in order to engage with the game in a competitive or even a casual way. Number three is most sales have gone through LGS. There's a small amount of product that was up on Amazon, but it was all full price the entire time. It hasn't hit the target shelves. It hasn't been in Barnes and Noble yet. I assume that at some point they'll pull the trigger on, you know, at least two player starters or something like that. And I'm giving them my blessing to feel free to put a two player starter out in those places because I need those mainstream customers to understand and learn the game to come to me to find out to buy singles to play in my events. I'm okay with it. It's cool that you're not doing it though too. I, I like selling starters as much as anything else. Number two, and this could be number one as well. Uh, their discipline with the stock thus far is unlike anybody's ability in this industry ever. It was something that I ended up talking to them about a couple of different times. Gating the stock and allowing the market to sell through, not just sell to, is great for being able to foster a nice uh, market environment when it comes to sealed and it comes to singles. The fact that they have stock available and they're going to release it at different sequences is great. Everybody gets a chance to sort of get some of that supply. And it's not like what would typically happen, which would be you'd have your first initial stock, the people that knew knew, and they'd grab as much of it as they possibly could to sell it. And there'd never be any more for the people that came in late. This was a problem that we ran into with One Piece. This is a problem that we ran into with Lorcana. This is a problem that we ran into with Dragon Ball. This is this happens all the time. And, and, and it takes a great deal of discipline from the publishers to be able to pull back and say, I'm not going to jump on this short term gain. I'm going to I'm going to this thing to grow a little bit. So the stores that were maybe not there for us for release, they're going to have an opportunity to buy into that stuff to be able to bring that to the local consumers. Even if it initially they said, I'm not carrying this game because nobody asked me to carry it, which is not a great thing to say as a retailer, but I understand where you're coming from when you, when you decide to, to do that. That's not what I do. I curate stock. I bring good games to consumers. I do the research. I go through this process that I sort of laid out where I'm looking at what they did. I'm paying attention to it. I'm looking at influencers. Why does it matter to me? How good is this game going to be? And then the number one reason that I think that it could have long-term success is that the, the game length. It's fast. The game plays fast. That's not to say that you can't have two control decks that take a little while. You know, there was certainly a match on, on the stream for the UK event over the weekend. It was Palpatine versus Thrawn. It was a slog fest. Everybody sat and they, I mean, watching the game a little bit, I felt like either or both players could have been a little more aggressive in the middle of the game. So that would have, that would have sped the game up as well. Um, but in general, the game plays pretty quickly. So it's a good two out of three game. 
It's got sideboards. In general, I think that the, the game length favors teaching the game, it favors new players coming in and not feeling like they're behind and that sort of thing. And then for honorable mention, I'd say the OP roadmap is really intelligently designed. The way that they've decided that they're gonna let the game sort of marinate a little bit, get it into fans' hands before they decide to go crazy with their different events. And sort of the nice thing about it is they've been respectful of letting the LGSs sort of take the game, build the community that they want out of that, and then sort of go from there. So. Overall, it's been a really nice experience with them. So, you know, hats off to the FFG team, everybody over there, the Asmodee team that was part of it, as far as like being able to have this layout and this nice roadmap for a game and putting the assets and the resources into what they need to do. And when I talked to other retailers after I'd gone through this process, I let them know this is a different team because a lot of people thought, oh, well, yeah, we've seen this before and same old asthma day, they're gonna do this, they're gonna do that, it's all gonna be on Amazon or we're gonna have all the, it, none of that stuff was true. The, the, the game was launched, it was super, super successful. They had a great plan. They did things in a modern way and the, the sales, the success, the uh, enthusiasm for the game sort of speaks for itself. So overall, um, I don't have anything but positive things to say about Star Wars. Yes, I wish I had some more supply. Apparently that's coming next week or the week after, so I'm excited about that. I'd love to sell some more product. I've got more OP stuff coming as well. There's some event packs that I have coming in because we're running out of those pretty quickly, but in general, uh, uh, I think the game has been great. So thanks for everybody that stopped by. I'm not sure what I'm gonna talk about next week. Maybe Kickstarter, we'll see. Thanks.